1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Thanks, moms and dads, for training your children, giving them under the, the tutelage of such wonderful people. And uh, Ms. Shiplin just recently completed an authorship of a, a training book on music. We appreciate that so very much to have such wonderful, gifted people serving the Lord with their young people. And thank you for getting them here on a Wednesday night. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Let's read verse number 1. The Bible says this. And Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of what? Or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech... And my preaching was not with the enticing, what? Of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among, you, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for, they, uh, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd please help us tonight as we take a few minutes to talk about the responsibility of soul winning and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray you'd help me and help uh, the church family. Thank you for their presence here this evening. May it be a profitable time. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, I want to thank you for coming on a Wednesday night. And I want to take this week and next week and just talk to you a little bit about how to lead someone to Christ. For some of you, it might be old hat. But for many of us, it may be old hat, but oftentimes we're not using the hat. We're not sharing the gospel. And the gospel is not broken. The gospel, the gospel will work if we will work the gospel. But many of us struggle with that, and myself included. I think I could probably stay in my office 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and still have something to do on the eighth day. It just seems like it's nonstop. I've still got things. You can stay at your house, and you can clean it, and get it all together, and you can still have something else to do. But to get out and to share the gospel with people is a necessity. You can't spell the gospel without go. Good. And if you don't go, people don't come. We want to have a soul-winning church because I believe that's how God designed the church. I was speaking today to a man who came here, and Brother Dick Kennedy came here back in 1973, if I'm not mistaken. Or 77? What day? What week? What time did you come, Brother Dick? 76. He was in Michigan, and he kept driving down, and he heard Brother Hiles preach, and they would come spend their whole day. They'd drive down from Michigan, spend the, the day at church, and go back. And he and his buddy would drive down on Wednesday night for after they got off work and run down here, and the time changed, and hear Brother Hiles preach. Finally, they decided to move on down here, and they came on down here and lived in the, the fancy-pantsy meadows here across the way, wherever that is. I don't know where it is, but uh, I'm geographically disabled. I can't figure out where things are when I get here. But nonetheless, they moved in there and started going to church here. And he said this to me when I talked to him. He said, Pastor, he said, um, I'd been to a church that the, people, the way people got saved is people came and the preacher preached, and that's how they got saved. He said, and there's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, many people get saved that way. Nothing wrong with that particular model. But if every time that you, you, we came here and the preacher just preached the gospel again and again and again, Christians will not grow very much. See, the church is for Christians. It's not for the unsaved. The music is not designed for the other saved. It's designed for the Lord Jesus Christ. The way we attire ourselves is not designed for us and our feelings. It's, a, it's for the Lord. Uh, it is about Him. It's about His Word, His truth, His church, His people. And unfortunately, many churches today are trying to make a church so that the world will like them. But the world is not going to be attracted through the church. They've got better buildings than we have, and they've got more expensive buildings, and they have oftentimes many more gifted and talented people in the world. But it, a church is for people. 
But the God's plan for a church is that people who have the Spirit of God inside of them and the love of God in them and the command of God would leave these buildings and go into all the world and tell people about Christ and then bring them to the body of believers. Help them follow the Lord and believers' baptism and then teach them to observe all things. Whatsoever God's command, just like behind those walls there tonight, is a, a group of disciples, who, many of which have gotten saved in recent months and now they're learning the truths of, of, of salvation, eternal security, baptism, and the Word of God. Though if you have not taken those classes, I would encourage you, consider if you ever want to serve the Lord in the ministry here, I hope you'll take time to go through at least four of those lessons. I want that to be deep inside of every one of our members here. They have that heart inside of them. Because healthy people will talk about Jesus. We talk about things we love. That's why we sometimes do not talk about Christ. We can talk about the Bears, we can talk about the Cowboys, we can talk about playoffs and the Bulls and other things, and, and then we just kind of get lockjaw when it comes to Jesus. It's because we love the Bulls, and we're fond of Jesus. We love sports, it's okay with Jesus. We're nervous about that. But I think a lot of the nervousness comes because we don't know how to share the gospel. And I want to take tonight, I'm just going to give a little nuts and bolts, and then next Wednesday night, I'm going to take and sit down on the platform here with another person that, uh, and explain and just kind of demonstrate how I would share the gospel with somebody else in my life. And, and I had a wonderful opportunity when I was in fourth grade. My dad signed me up for a soul winning class. Brother Hiles and Brother... Uh, uh, Brother Rice came to our church, the Temple Baptist Church. We were living at that time in Johnson City, Tennessee. We're living, I was living in the projects there in that city. And my dad took me to the revival. I remember sitting, on the, sitting right here on the, on the chair outside the pew. There were so many people in the auditorium that they had chairs lined up on each aisle. And I sat right there. And Dr. John Rice came and sat right there beside me. I felt so uh, honored that he would sit there. He was an older gentleman, of course. And I looked down there and saw him working on his message and and uh, things of that nature. But when that, when that thing got done, our pastor decided to have soul winning training. And my dad signed me up to be at the soul winning training as a fourth grader. And I took my little Gideon New Testament and I began to highlight, listen to what the people were saying. And I highlighted all the verses. I memorized the verses and, and learned how to share. I sit down in front of the mirror and I was telling that guy in the mirror how he could get saved and, and uh, explaining that. And then one day I was sitting on the, I was playing football with some guys in our neighborhood, and one of the boys' name was Eric. And I remember sitting on the football there. We were all done playing. I was sitting on the football, and Eric was kind of laid out in the, in the grass there. I said, Eric, you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? He said, he said, no. I said, if I could show you from the Bible how you could know, will you let me? He said, sure. I said, hold my football. I'll be right back. And I ran down the little sidewalk and up to the up to the second floor of that little apartment and got my New Testament, ran out there and sat on the on the, the sidewalk and explained to Eric how he could be saved. Showed him he was a sinner, he deserved the lake of fire, and Jesus loved him and wanted to save me, we could save and he needed to trust Jesus Christ. And and I don't know exactly all that happened, but I heard Eric ask the Lord to save him. And I don't know what happened in Eric's heart completely, because I have not been able to see him. That was many years ago, and I was 10, and he was 10 or 11 years old, and, and I haven't seen him in 35, 36 years. But I know what happened in my heart that night. That day, when I, and I saw him get saved, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm going to tell somebody else. Good. That was good. And the Bible says in, he went from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to the, to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. From going to hell to going to heaven. And through the years, of course, for many years I wasn't a pastor. For the first 11 years after I finished school, I was a school teacher. I don't know exactly why I'm a pastor. I'm sure thank the Lord that I get the chance to do that. But I will tell you this, even as a school teacher for 11 years, I would try to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Because I found that I'm not a very good soul winner. I'm just one beggar. Tell another beggar where he found some food. If you find a good deal, you find some much, you want them to know about the good deal. If you find gas for $2.50, please tell me. <laughs> if you find they're giving away Krispy Kreme donuts somewhere, let me know about that. You know? You find there's a good deal, I'd like to know about that. You'd be my friend if you told me. 
But the Bible says that the gospel is a mystery to most people. Most people do not know how to get to heaven from here. If you went out and you just went around, you tried to find 10 people that are strangers to you, and you asked them, do you know for how to get to heaven? If I, I know, I want to know how to get to heaven from here, how would you tell me? Most people say, you got me. Or they'll tell you wrong directions. But for most of us, we know how. The mystery has been unveiled. I know I'm going to heaven, and I know how to get there. But for most of the world, it's a mystery that God put in earthen vessels. And you and I need to share that mystery with other people. How, how cruel it would be to have the, uh, when I think about some people who suffer so chronically, and you could actually have the, the antidote or the help or the cure for their disease and you won't tell them. You could help them and we don't do it. That would be cruel of us. And yet, that's the same way, and the Bible says their blood will be required at our hands. I don't know what all that means, but I don't like it. I'd like to be faithful to share the gospel with people. I'd like to go to church with people that are faithful witnesses. We not, may not be all we ought to be, but we ought to be concerned about souls. We ought to be praying about our souls. Pastor, why do we ask people to pray for unsaved people? Because prayer changes things. Praying just changes my opinion of people. Makes me think, when I pray for my neighbors, I'm more concerned. Next time I see them, I'm thinking not just about um, their yard and the leaves in their yard or, or their, their car they're driving. I'm thinking about, does that guy know he's saved? Do they know he's saved? So I, I've been going around. I've been praying for each of my neighbors on my, my area, 14 houses around me, and I'm praying that God will save each of those people. And I hope he'll save them sooner than later. Linda went this last week, and she went to each of the houses and gave them each an invitation to the Christmas program and, and got to sit and talk with several of them and learn their story and things of that nature, all of that for the purpose of trying to get the gospel to them. I believe I don't live where I live on, on accident. You don't live where you live on accident. I'm not responsible for your neighbors as much as I am responsible for mine. You're not responsible for mine. Where you work and what you do, that's your, that's your responsibility. Sometimes we can become such incubated in, in our own thing. That's why a bus routes are really good for your kids, your children. Get them in there where there's, where there's unsaved people out there, where they can, they can minister to people and see the joy of, of being able to be a help in somebody. But don't be an incubator. I love the Christian school. I love church. I love the choir. I love all the things our kids get to do. But boy, don't just be us four and no more. Take the gospel to the people around you and realize uh, why God puts you in the places you, of your place uh, of ministry. And, and then seek the lost. As the Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Jesus came. And he says, even as the Father has sent me, so send I you. We need to take that seriously. So with that in mind tonight, Apostle Paul says, listen, I'm just going to remind you, when I came to Corinth, I did not come with excellent speech. Not everybody's gifted with the, with the gift of gab, but most of us are. Most of us, were okay at talking. We can understand. People can understand what we have to say. He said, but it wasn't my excellent speech, my oratory skills. Matter of fact, the church at Corinth compared him to Apollos. And they said, now, Apollos can preach. What you do, Paul, is just mess around. Paul's all right, but Apollos, whoo-hoo, he's eloquent. We like to hear him speak. And by the way, you always want to be careful. You don't get so enthralled with the, with the style. And, and make sure you get the substance correctly. But it's not, it's not so much the excellent speech. We didn't come, and we didn't try to be so intellectual that you didn't get it. We tried to keep the jelly on the bottom shelf. And we came to you so that the power might not be of us, but the glory might be of God. And that we would have the power of the Spirit of God resting upon us. One of the reasons that we know that we're supposed to be Spirit-filled is so that we can be a soul winner. When you pray, by the way, have you asked God to fill you with His power? Has it even come across your radar last week to say, Lord, fill me with power? Brother Hiles used to teach us that years ago. Pray for power. Ask God, Lord, give me your Spirit's help. 
Help me to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. Give me power to, to raise my children, to work hard, to make right decisions, even to the clothes we put on and the way we take to work and, and, the, and, and what gas station we get fuel at and where we're going to go. Lord, is there any reason why you have me in this store rather than that store? Is there any reason this guy standing in line behind me instead of, instead of me in some other place or him over there? Is there a reason? I was uh, eating at a restaurant recently and, and uh, there was a little couple and I sneezed and, and they said, oh, bless you. I said, oh, thank you very much, you know. And, and anyway, went on and I looked over and he had his little happy holidays hat on, you know, and they're kind of an older couple and looked like they were just, uh, were eating at Arby's and, and, he, and he was over there and I thought they were just, they were just very interested. They said, oh, it's going to get cold tonight. I said, well, that's good. You know, I'm thinking, thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> I don't need to hear about that now. Uh, but he, he was talking about things, and I started talking to them, and we talked about several things, and, and then I said, well, God bless you guys, have a good day, and um, they said, okay, you too, and I walked out, and boy, you talk about the Spirit of God grabbing hold of me, and saying, all right, idiot, get back over there and talk to those people about me, how about that? I said, all right, yes, sir. <laughs> I threw my trash away, I went around, I said, you know what, I left you guys, and I shouldn't have left you before I at least shared with you the most wonderful news anyone ever shared with me. It's on the back of this gospel tract. And they said, really? I said, yes. And they said, well, thank you very much. And, and they said, well, we'll read it. I said, well, thank you. I hope you will. And I, I drove away and watched them as they sat there. And they, he, he leaned over next to her. And they were going through and looking at the gospel tract. But boy, how, I, how the Spirit of God, he loves people and he wants them to be saved. And the harvest has never been the problem. It's the harvesters, the problem. It's the helpers. Well, I want to speak to you tonight just for a few minutes from our lesson. And my lesson's a little bit jarbled, and please forgive me. I gave it to the, the girls that printed it in a wrong, in a wrong order in a couple things. But please forgive me about that. But let's just, let me give you the points real quick. Number one, if I'm going to be a soul winner, I must learn to daily walk with God. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Walk with God. You spend time with God, you'll talk about Him. You will not be embarrassed about sharing about Christ if you really love Him. Walk with God. Number two, we must learn to share our own testimony of salvation. I think one of the most powerful tools to share with somebody on getting them interested is people love a story. Apostle Paul, I think, was the the model of this particular thing. He would share his story about what he used to be, what happened when he got saved, and how good God's been to him since that time. And I'm sure that Titus had it by memory. Timothy definitely knew it. Barnabas, Silas, here we go, here we go again. He's going to tell it. God put it four times in the Bible. So if we got it three or four times in the Bible, surely he must have said it over and over and over again. And I think learning to tell your testimony of salvation is an important tool. People love to hear about what God did for you. I oftentimes will open up with saying, you know, the very best day of my life, someone explained to me from the Bible how I can know for sure I'm going to heaven. They asked me a hard question. I didn't know the answer, but it was okay because it became the very best day of my life. And if I can tell them the circumstance, I'll tell them more of that. But tell them your story. With that, I want you to skip down, if you would please, where it says, uh, it, it, that was num Roman number, number two. Skip down to the little dot there where it says, here's about the testimony. Here's just a little, uh, little bit of thought about that. And you can draw an arrow if you want from number two down to the dot. In your testimony, keep it short. And keep it simple. Keep your testimony. Don't give them a 20-minute story, okay? You'll lose them. Keep it, be able to share your testimony maybe like 30 seconds, a minute. So you can tell kind of uh, where, where you were and what God did for you and how good it's been to know the Lord is your Savior and the peace. Number two, keep it Christ-centered. This is what Jesus did for me. This is not what the church did for me. This is not what baptism did for me. This is not what my mom or my dad did for me. This is what Christ did for me. The next thing, emphasize the power of God. Look, emphasize what God's power did. 
How many of you were in a mess when God saved you? Would you raise your hand? Everybody was, but, but and that's why one of the reasons, listen, sometimes when you get saved is you're young. I was young. I was in first grade. And uh, I, I kind of I forget how hard, it, how, how uh, wonderful it is to be saved. And, and, and you, you don't realize what you've got. And you think, you know what, uh, you know, I really feel like I, you, you forget what you, you, because you weren't saved from a lot of mess, you forget what you were saved to. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. By the way, if you got saved as a child, you better thank God a thousand times over. That God saved you when you were young and dumb, instead of old and dumb, with a lot more dumb things to be regretful about. Thank God God saved you. But keep your testimony short, keep it Christ-centered, and focus on the power of God that he did for you. Then the next thing, your testimony should have three parts. Before I trusted Christ, where I was, if you were lonely, tell you were lonely. If you were, if you were messed up in sin, if you were miserable, if you were without peace, those are things that I, I, would, I can't say that I was all messed up in, in wicked, profane sin, but I was, not, I was not at peace. I remember being in, in turmoil and convicted about my sin and, and, and wishing I had eternal life, wishing I knew how, how to get to heaven from here. Well, you can say that. What I was before I got saved. How God saved you, what Christ did to bring you, what God did to bring you to Christ. And then since, what Christ means to you now. Then let's go back up to number three there, if you would please. And here's, here's number three. We must learn to ask the spiritual questions. And these are, there's two questions I think are spiritual questions. If you ask them enough, someone will listen to you. Number one do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven, or do you have some doubt about that? That's question number one. Number two is, could I take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can know that? Now, they might, they might not answer in the affirmative, but I think if you ask enough people, could I take the Word of God and show you from the Bible in a few minutes how you can know that? If we would ask that spiritual question, many people would sit still long enough to do that. I'm pretty confident, probably, if you left the service tonight and just wanted to do an experiment, and you went up to 10 people and asked them those two questions, and asked them, if I took the Bible and showed you, would you, do you have time for me to take the Bible and explain that to you? Probably somebody would say, yeah. They may not get saved, but they'd probably listen to you. Ask the spiritual question. I usually ask people, I usually tell them, someone asked me one day, John, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? And I didn't know. I didn't have an idea. What I think that does to them is let them know, really? I don't know either. So it makes them not feel, if you just walk up to someone, do you know for sure if you're going to heaven? You know, and one time I asked a guy that, he goes, you're going to kill me? I said, no. <laughs> I asked him, you know, do you know for sure you're going to, what are you going to do, shoot me? You're going to hurt me? What happened? You know, I said, no, no, I'm just asking you a spiritual question. So you're making me feel, un, you make me feel uncomfortable. But if I tell them someone asked me that and then I give my quick testimony, then I oftentimes can say, how about you? Do you know for sure if you died, you go to heaven or do you have some doubt like I did? And oftentimes they're much more quick to say, yeah, well, I'm not real sure. I probably don't know either. And then you can ask them, could I have the opportunity to explain the gospel to you? So ask them if you did, or do you have some doubt about that? Now skip down, if you would, please, uh, to the letter A there underneath that. If their answer is no, then ask them if you could share the gospel. Or give them a chance to, to hear the gospel of Christ. Now I know that some folks are a little bit stronger than others, and I think God has given people different personalities and different uh, ways. I'm much more passive in, in, my, in my disposition. I don't think I'd be a good salesman. And I don't like to be pushed. If you push on me, I usually push back pretty hard. If, you, if I think you're trying to work me, I, I don't like that. It bothers me a little bit. And I want to get away from you. But if I feel like that you are trying to help me, I gravitate to you. If I feel like you don't have anything to gain by telling me this, I, I, and you, you're trying to help me, you're a sincere beggar, tell another beggar where he found some food, I kind of like that kind of a person. That's my temperament. Some guys like a hard charger. They like someone to get in their face and yell at them. Boy, you yell at me, and I want to punch you in a smot box, snot box. You know, I, I, don't, I don't like that. Just a different personality. 
But for me, I usually can give them that opportunity. If, they, if I say, listen, could I take the time to share with you from the Scripture? If they say no, I usually say, well, I'd love to do it to you. Maybe another time would be okay. Well, yeah, maybe another time. Okay. In the meantime, would you take time to read this track? Here, I'll write my cell number on it. Call me if I can help you in any way. It was the best day of my life when I understood those things. And I want to explain it to you if you'll give me a chance to do it. And then let them know there. And remember this, every fruit, if you will, is not ripe at the same time. Sometimes if you have an apple tree, it's not just one day, boom, all of them drop. Poo, they're all on the ground. No, it's a gradual process. Some of them, you can just come up there and hit them with a, hit your finger, thump them, and they'll fall right in your hands. Others of them, you're hanging on it, it still won't come off. What that one, the hard one, it's, it's not ripe yet. It needs more nutrients. It needs more sunshine. It needs more attention prior to it's ready to be picked. Sometimes that's the way people are. And it's kind of frustrating to me because I want everybody to get saved right now. I mean, I've been with people and thinking, why won't you get saved? I just don't feel like it. I'm not ready. I was witnessing to a man 82 years old recently. He goes, you know what? You have to talk to me when I'm a little older. I said, man, you're going to die. I said, your cask is probably in town right now. And I didn't say that to him, but that was my thought there. But you know what he was doing? He was, boast not thyself of tomorrow. I said, you're not sure you're going to be around, mister. And how God needs to help us with that. Well, what if they say, yes, I know for sure that uh, I have eternal life. How do you know for sure? I would ask them, how do you know for sure that you have eternal life? And then let them answer. On what basis do you know that you have eternal life? And then let them answer. And usually their answer will let you know what paradigm they're coming from. Or sometimes I'll ask them this. Let's say this. Uh, and I, I was witnessing to a man this week, and I said to him, sir, I said, sir, I said, you say you know you're going to heaven. I'm so glad. I know, and I'm happy too. But if we were to stand before Jesus, and we won't have to do this because it will all be decided. But if we were to come to heaven's gates and the Lord said, John, and I called his name, on what basis should I let you to live with me forever? What would you tell him? Why, are you, why do you think you have the right to come in and live with me in this holy place? What would you tell them? And let them tell him. And I remember one time that, that gentleman said, man, that's a hard question. And he went around and he basically told me the wrong answers. He said, I tell him, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. And I really, you know, I loved you my whole life. And I tried to be good to people, which told me that that brother needs to be saved. He's not saved yet. So what do you do when they tell us the wrong answer? You don't go, ha, you're wrong. No. You're going to go to hell if you believe that. And you can do that, but you're probably not going to be very successful. But what can you do when someone gives you the wrong answer? Once again, remember the gospel is a mystery to people who, who perish. So you can't just come and say, oh, no, that's where you're wrong. The Bible says, by grace you say, do faith. That's just going to go off them like a water off a duck's back. That's a verse you know real well, but they're very unfamiliar with that. They don't know what grace means. They don't know what faith means. They don't know by works and all that stuff. You know the verse. I know the verse. For those of us in here who are raised and in, in cut our teeth on the bed rails of church nursery beds, we know that verse. But that unsaved person, that verse is woo. That's why you've got to work for understanding. So at that moment, I, I have, I think I learned this uh, from Brother Chapel years ago. But there, I use the three C's. Number one, compliment. Number two, compare. And number three, correct. Can't let the guy keep believing that's wrong. If he believes that, he's going to go to hell in a heartbeat. He's going to spend eternity separated from God. But I would suggest that's a good strategy. And I find this when, when I went soul winning with Jesus and you go in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4 and John chapter 6 and, and you see how Jesus dealt with people. He dealt with them differently. He asked them some questions. He, he, he took them down different roads. And I think sometimes that's why we need to be spiritual so we'll know kind of what every person kind of needs. 
But first of all, if someone says, and that man told me, he said, well, you know what, I'm a good person. I try to do the best I can. And I've talked about God, and I've loved him my whole life. Well, the first thing I'd probably do is say, you know what? I really admire you. That's wonderful you're trying to be a good person. I'm glad that you have a, a love for spiritual things. I've complimented him. Number two, I will compare. I will say, you know what? I want to be a good person myself. And I really, I really want to love God and, and let other people know I love God. So now I've not only complimented, but I've compared. But then number three, I want to correct the wrong. You know, once you have handled somebody with, some, with dignity and care and respect, and you compliment, you compare, you can usually help them correct their error. Now there's when I may would say, you know, I thought the same thing till one day someone told me what the Bible says. And the Bible tells us that it's not by works of right things or righteous things that we've done. But the only way we go to heaven is because of God's mercy. Or we might use the same logic of saying to somebody, you know, um, if you could go to heaven, I heard Brother, Brother uh, Woosley last night did this at the concert, the end of the service, which was so beautifully done and a great way to share the gospel and stimulate people's thinking. But he said this, if you could go to heaven, and I can go to heaven by being good and loving God, then why would Jesus have to die and go to the cross? Let them think about that for a second. And just telling you know, it helped me when someone took the time to show me from the Bible how I could really understand the gospel. Would you mind if I took time to share that with you? Then you can go through the gospel. And once again, some people, I've witnessed to some people, they'll say, yeah, yeah I'd like to know that. Other people will say, you know, I'm not ready right now. Then I, I just, I feel like I'm, I'm not there to win, a, win an argument. I'm there to spread seed. For those who are ready, I'm there just checking to see if they're ready to fall off, not there to hang on it. I don't really go looking for a fight. I, I'm looking for who God has already worked in their heart. And boy, I'm telling you what, those are some wonderful, wonderful memories of sharing the gospel. Well, with that in mind, look at, look at uh, the next thing, number four. Ask for an opportunity to show them from the Bible how they can know for sure, 100% sure they're going to heaven. Number five. Learn to share the four basic Bible truths for salvation. Learn to, learn to share it. And those, I'll put those, share, I'll share those out with you and we'll go over those next week. Number one, we must understand that we're sinners and we cannot go to heaven on our own. Because of our sin, we cannot go to heaven on our own. I, I, that needs to be explained. And it's best explained from the Bible. Once again, I just now told you this and you understand this, I hope. But unsaved people, first of all, they're at a disadvantage because spiritual things have to be spiritually discerned. Okay, they, if you're saved, you have an antenna for the scriptures. You have antennas built inside of you called the Holy Spirit of God who teaches you spiritual things. The Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They cannot because they must be spiritually discerned. So the Bible is words on a page to the average person without Christ. It, they can read it, but it does not resonate to them the same way as it will resonate to someone who has the author living inside of them. So you cannot take for granted the person you're talking to understands things. And I thank God for those who lead people to Christ at the altar. But I'm telling you, I don't care if you're leading people to Christ at the altar or you're leading someone in their living room Take the time to make sure there's understanding. Don't you ever let me rush you getting someone to get saved if, if they don't understand the gospel. It, it is, it's life and death. It's not a one, two, three, pray after me. God bless you, you're in the family. It is, it is sharing the wonderful truths of God's word. And it doesn't have to be rushed. It has to be, you're looking for clarity. But they don't, you can say all day long, the wages of sin is death. Get to God's eternal life, eternal Jesus Christ. Now, I know that verse. You know that verse. But to them, it's the first time they've ever heard it. They must have it explained to them. You might remember the Ethiopian uh, eunuch was reading the Bible. 
going across the backside of the desert on the way back from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia to handle the queen's business, reading the Bible. And Philip comes to him and said, understandest what thou readest. He said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. Why? Because Philip had the Holy Spirit. That guy was without the Holy Spirit. That guy was much more educated than Philip was, and yet Philip had an insight on the Scriptures because he was saved. And he took time. I don't know how long that little stagecoach was riding along the desert, but I don't think it was two minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes. I think it was a little bit of time of explaining the gospel of Christ to him. And I'm not saying that someone can't get saved like that. I've had people get saved in moments, but that's because there had been a lot of farming before I ever got there. There'd been, and sometimes in a, in, a, in a service like this, there'll be a, a very clear presentation. People are ready to get saved as soon as they walk down the aisle. But most of the time, people need a clear understanding of the gospel of Christ. Learn to share it simply, easily. Well, we're sinners. We can't go to heaven. And I'll give you a quick, the other thoughts real quickly. Because of our sin, we owe the price of, can someone fill in the blank there? Death. And death needs to be explained. We'll explain that next week. The death a physical death and a spiritual death. Then Jesus paid the price of our sin and God offers us the gift of eternal life. I believe a gift needs to be explained. I think it's very important. Most people, unsaved, believe that salvation is a reward for being righteous, not a gift for the guilty. And that's, an, that's a hurdle you have to overcome with people. And the older they get, the more... I've had people sometimes say, Pastor, I have never heard that in my entire life. It's a gift, not a reward. I thought it was worth... Even when they say, well, let's go on to our reward. They think it's eternal life as a reward. And there is reward for those who are Christians, but salvation is not one of them. Everyone gets in the park the same way, by the gift of eternal life, by Jesus Christ. The last thing, we must now... Believe and receive Jesus Christ as God's substitute for our sin. And we'll talk about that as we demonstrate that next week. Thank you for being here this evening. Let's stand together, could you please?